Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Susan McKay, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this event, which is part of the Bloody Sunday 50 Commemorations. Um, this event is organised by the Bloody Sunday Trust and the Pat Finucan Centre, and it's called Pinochet Plus Amnesty. And I'm very, very pleased to introduce the Reverend Nicholas Mercer, who is the Rector of Bolton Abbey in Yorkshire, and he was formerly Lieutenant Colonel Nicholas Mercer, who was a senior legal advisor to the 1st Armoured Division in the British Army. So Reverend Mercer, you're now a Church of England pastor, but you're, you were formerly quite a senior British Army officer and you served in both Iraq and in, in Northern Ireland. Can you, can you tell me a bit about how that came about, um, how you came to be in the, in the British Army? Is it a family thing? Yes, I mean, I come from a long, like many people in the army, I come from an army family. Uh, my grandfather served in the British Army in the First World War and the Second World War. My mother was very much in the mould of an army daughter. Um, my father had briefly done his national service and I had many relations who served in, in the British Army as well. So going into the army was, was really not such a radical move, albeit that I was the first lawyer member of the family to go into the British Army. And tell me about your grandfather. Uh, well, interestingly, he was born in County Monaghan in 1897. And I'm not quite sure how he joined up, but I know that he was sent to a Yorkshire Infantry Regiment as a young second lieutenant in 1914. Quite how that happened, I, I, it's lost in the eons of time, but he found himself thrown across to a, a different part of the, then the United Kingdom, uh, and then obviously survived the First World War and then served in the second as well, finishing his military career uh, in the 1950s um, and by that stage having separated from my grandmother he peculiarly went back to this time Northern Ireland and died in Belfast in 1978. It's very interesting so you're from an Irish family? Yeah very much so and it's, it's so easy to lose sight of that um, but I'm, I'm always conscious of my grandfather would fly over to see us from Belfast to Leeds Bradford he would make that flight each year and see it annually till his death. So I was conscious of it as a child. He died when I was aged 11. And one or two Irish cousins, as I call them, have come over to England and now live and work here. And interestingly, one of the cousins married an army officer as well. So there's, there's quite a common bond, really, which is rather nice. So we've, we've kept it loosely kept in touch. And do you share the same sort of political views as, as your family in relation to Ireland? Uh, no, not at all. It's really interesting. I think it's um, the family that remain in the what is now the Republic. They're, they're just to the other side of the Irish border and see themselves very much as unionists. Um, and they have a, dis a particular political outlook, unionism, which seems very old fashioned to those of us who live in England. I mean, we look across the water askance at some of the views that are held. I think those of us who, who live in England now have moved on politically. Um, and whereas they rejoice in the fact that they've got British passports, we rejoice in the fact that we've got Irish passports, <laughs> Brexit. So what a complicated political picture it's become, particularly since 2016. When, of course, my generation and, and those beneath me in the main are furious about Brexit and losing our EU citizenship. So we've reached out to get our Irish citizenship. So we have this strange, peculiar dynamic of having sworn allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen, from which we would never waver, uh, but proudly having an Irish passport at the same time, which gives us a free pass into all the benefits that Europe confers. Um, I wondered how long it would take us to get to Brexit. Um, I should say that uh, you're talking to quite a lot of people who have their Irish citizenship but are still furious at the loss of their membership of, of the EU. But that's another story and not quite what we're here to talk about today. Um, we will return. We, sorry? When I spoke to my Irish cousins, they, they hadn't really taken on board the fact that many people were now getting Irish passports who had formerly served in the British Army, uh, and they, they hadn't seen that particular dynamic. 
that that, that was now a, a new reality. That people <laughs> openly embraced this and their Irish roots have rediscovered Irish roots, <laughs> Yeah, well, we will return to Brexit, I'm sure, in the course of our conversation, uh, particularly in, in relation to what it has done to Anglo-Irish relations. But um, just at the moment, I mean, obviously, you've joined us today because of comments that you'll be wanting to make in relation to issues that are very relevant to the Bloody Sunday um, question, if I can call it that. But in, just to start off with, could you tell us a bit about your um, career in the British Army and um, and where it took you and, and, and therefore what you learned. Yes. I mean, you say you were a lawyer or did you train as a lawyer before you joined the army? Yeah, you, you had to qualify as a lawyer before you joined. So I, I was admitted as a solicitor in 1990 and I joined the British Army almost immediately upon qualification. So I joined the British Army in 1991 and, and then went wherever the British Army was serving. So I started my military career in Germany I was then in Berlin. Uh, I then went out to the Balkans as part of the I-4, the NATO force to implement the Dayton Peace Agreement. And I did that for six months and came back and then was posted to Northern Ireland. And I served in Northern Ireland from 1995 to 1997. Uh, and I think that was a really important time legally and politically. It, it actually had quite a bearing on many of the legal issues and the new legal climate that was about to descend upon the British Army at that you, time. Before we, we get to that, could you tell us about, um, about what happened when you were in Iraq and some of the experience that you had there in terms of what you learned about um, the intersection of law and the behaviour of the army? Yes, I think I was call myself Soldier Blue because I was so naive about the political interface in military operations. Um, I mean, I trained in the laws of war, which is our sort of battlefield occupation for lawyers. So the mainstay of our life as a lawyer was really prosecuting people at court martials. Um, but our battlefield occupation, if you like, was advising commanders on the laws of war. So we specialized in that and I taught it for a decade in, in, for the, on behalf of the International Committee of the Red Cross. So I was pretty familiar with the Geneva Conventions protocols and various other treaties um, that, 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 were that were relevant uh, to the battlefield situation. Um, for me, probably the most defining moment was coming, coming across the abuse of prisoners in an interrogation facility. Um, it was quite by chance and very early on in the conflict, but I, was visiting the prisoner of war camp and then found an interrogation facility bolted onto the side of the prisoner of war camp. And so I decided to investigate that facility and found prisoners there being abused. Uh, they were hooded and in stress positions. And in my view, the generators were being used to generate what's termed white noise. Uh, so I tried to put a stop to it uh, but was told by the commander of the interrogation facility that he didn't come under the divisional command. So I couldn't put a stop to it by virtue of my rank and position. Uh, but as soon as I got back to the divisional headquarters that night, I put in a complaint that the prisoners were being abused in this inter interrogation facility. Um, and that that sort of sparked a chain of events that have almost remained with me ever since, because that debate has gone on and on and on and on. It currently transpired in the subsequent inquiry following the death of Baha Musa, that the prisoners had been subjected to the five techniques. So there was an unexpected and rather peculiar link to what had happened in Northern Ireland in the 1970s. Yeah, could you just tell us briefly about Baha Musa? Well, Baha Musa was, was a prisoner uh, in, in Iraq and he was captured by the 1st Battalion of the Queen's Lancashire Regiment and he was taken to a holding facility within the battalion lines uh, and to put it bluntly he was beaten to death. He was found dead in the facility, he was handcuffed behind his back and had 93 sites of injury on his body. Now, the, the tie-in with me is that was after I'd left Iraq 
that I sent in my complaint in March 2003, uh, and there was a whole load of subsequent traffic between myself and higher headquarters and politicians regarding the treatment of prisoners, which was largely ignored. And then in September 2003, a man was now dead in an interrogation facility. And when at that stage, were you aware of, of the parallel with the, the use of the five techniques in Northern Ireland? No, to at the early fair, stage of the troubles. To be fair, I wasn't. It mm. goes back to the early 70s when I was still in short trousers. But in, in 2003, were you aware that there was a link there or, or tell us about when you began to look at those two situations as, as being comparable? I didn't make that link at the time. Mm -hmm. For me, it was very straightforward. This amounted to violence and intimidation, which breaches the Geneva Conventions. So as we were in an international armed conflict, I applied international law to that scenario. For me, it had been clearly violated by the interrogation techniques employed by the interrogation teams. Um, of course, in Northern Ireland, there is an issue about domestic law, but also the Convention on Human Rights would come into play automatically there. But for me, it was Geneva Convention from a battlefield situation. And are you shocked at the fact that the, the British Army used, that the authorities used um, the five techniques back then in the 1970s in Northern Ireland? What I've learned subsequently about it, I mean, I came across this for the first time in 2003. Um, the, I read, subsequently read a book called, and reviewed a book called Cruel Britannia uh, by Ian Cobain when I left the army. And I was asked to review this book and I read what is a, 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 an account of torture by the British army from 1944 to date. Uh, you know, I, I was horrified not only had we used fair, well, repulsively brutal techniques on our prisoners uh, throughout the colonial campaigns, but these had included Northern Ireland in the 70s. And in a sense, it was an attempt to refine techniques so it didn't leave any marks on the body. You know, I, I, my whole training had been humanitarian law, and the clue is in the title. It's about being humane. And all these things have been going on in the shadows, skillfully covered up. And now I found myself as a footnote in this whole unpleasant chapter. Of course, the, the um, hooded men, as, as they have become known, have, have recently had success in their appeals against the way that they, they were treated. I know, but it's such a long saga. Mm -hmm. This goes back to the 1970s. It's now 50 years later. Mm -hmm. And what will become, who was held accountable for the torture that was perpetrated and those who authorised it? There are so many questions around the application of torture. Who authorised it? Who administered it? Who was complicit in it? And why is no one ever brought to account for it? Well, these are obviously questions that apply to many of the things that we're, we're going to be discussing today. So let's move to the time that you served in Northern Ireland. It was an interesting period, a very interesting period from 1995 to 97. We'd had the ceasefires in 1994 and it was an intensive period of the peace process. What was your experience in Northern Ireland at that time? Well, it was, it was a really interesting chapter, as you say, and I really enjoyed my time in Northern Ireland. Um, not least was people generally pretty friendly, which was, was very pleasant. And I also believed in the cause. You know, it, this was about law and order. This was about upholding the democratic will of the people. And unlike Iraq, which was murky legally, for me, this seemed much more straightforward. Um, but it taught me a number of things. Um, first of all, I was directly, one of my jobs was to do compensation for those who'd been injured uh, in the conflict. Because it wasn't an armed conflict as such, it was deemed to be a criminal act, and therefore soldiers could get criminally, criminal injury compensation for that, the injuries they suffered. Um, and so that was quite an interesting task, but it peculiarly brought me into contact with Rita Resterick, and the wife of James Bradwell. So I had contact with the relations of the last two people to be killed in the Troubles, 
in the British Army. So I would, my job was to quantify the damages for someone's death. So I went to see Mrs. Bradwell uh, in the northeast of England, and I went to see Ruta Restory in the Midlands. So I had personal contact with both families uh, and con obviously involved in the loss that they'd suffered and all that that entailed. At the same time, my job was also to be a flying lawyer. So the army had now got the system in place that if a soldier was arrested, we then would deploy to the police station where they'd been arrested and we would give them legal advice in the police station, for which the army was extremely grateful. But what it also came into play was the, the what shall I, how shall I put it? There was a temptation on our side to bend the law, if you like. One, in one RUC station, I was asked to pervert the course of justice, which I found astonishing. In also, what way? What way? Well, I, I don't want to go into too many details, but we were asked to rig an interview. Uh, the, the, the RUC officer did it with all, you know, I'm well, helping the soldiers, but, you know, we were here to uphold the rule of law, not to break it. I don't want to sound overly pious, but I said, no, on certain times, no. I think he was quite shocked that I pushed back against that and then equally on I went out to another case and this was this time a Republican area and the police were unable to collect the evidence and lawyers had been tasked for the victims to go and collect the evidence themselves and I said no you, you know this is about upholding the rule of law you're the police I want the police surgeon to be involved I want statements taken by in those days, RUC officers. So there was, there's always a temptation in these circumstances to un undermine the rule of law. And I saw it as our job was to uphold the rule of law. And if you stick to that principle, then you won't go far wrong in my view, but there's there is temptations all the time to try and subvert it. And did you report that incident of where you were asked to rig the interview? No, I didn't actually. I just said no. I, mean, I just carried it anecdotally. Um, so I think that was really interesting. I think the other thing that was important about Northern Ireland was, first of all, the age of accountability, I think, had come across on the British Army, and I think they were slow to recognise that. And so the Lee Clegg case had just been decided, Clegg had gone to jail, every bullet was now being counted. And we sort of got that as lawyers because we're used to breaking down cases into their constituent parts. But there was a reluctance almost by the army to accept that this new age was upon them. And I think as so often the lawyers get there before the institution which they serve, that a new age had dawned and things were going to be different. The last thing I would say is that when we captured people, um, such was the rigour of the courts that if you abuse someone during capture, subsequent prosecution was liable to be jeopardised. So you jolly well treat your prisoners properly, not least because that has the potential to bring about a successful conviction, if indeed that is the proper outcome. So you had returned to um, England uh, after your service in Northern Ireland. You were there for when the Good Friday Agreement was it came about as an army lawyer what aspects of the Good Friday Agreement um, struck you as being particularly important? Well, it, it's really interesting because you, I think there's a temptation if you live in England, just in Northern Ireland, sort of out on a limb. And when you live there, you, you eat and drink that, that life and that political narrative in a way that you might not do otherwise. So I remember hearing about the Good Friday Agreement when I was back in England and, and sort of my heart leaping for joy this was a, an astonishing political achievement to bring about peace, which two years earlier, you know, had seemed so distant. I mean, Mo Molum used to be in the headquarters in Northern Ireland a lot, but we knew she was around, but not precisely what was going on. But the Good Friday Agreement was an astonishing achievement and, you know, to bring about conditions which restored peace to Northern Ireland was one of the great triumphs of the Blair administration. I know he gets rightly heavily criticised for Iraq, but he should also rightly be praised for what happened in Northern Ireland. So it's, it's really the, the, the main thrust of it is bringing peace to Northern Ireland 
in, in seemingly bleak circumstances. It was a, a, a huge political triumph. And you at that time, uh, you, I know that you spoke uh, at Stormont just last year uh, to a parliamentary group, and um, you mentioned that at the time of the Good Friday Agreement, you thought that a Truth and Reconciliation Commission was the proper way forward in terms of dealing with the legacy of the, of the conflict here. I, I did feel at the time that this was a moment in time for a possible sort of drawing a line under the whole Northern Ireland chapter and episode. Um, yes, and I was enthusiastic for that. How, how do you draw a line under everything? But I think it has, the political climate has to be right. And I think that political climate has now changed. At the same well, time- Just before, before we move on to how it has changed, at that time, one of, the, one of the things that you said was that you felt that within the Good Friday Agreement, there was a kind of amnesty in any case for um, terrorists. Yeah, Can you just explain that? Well, I mean, there, there was, you know, uh, and th that political move had been made. So if once that is in motion, then it could be seen as a logical conclusion to it. I would say that my position has changed substantially since then by what I subsequently went on to learn and have been involved in. Yeah, it is, it is worth noting <laughs> at this point that the Good Friday Agreement did see the prisoners released and it also saw uh, an agreement that those subsequently convicted would only serve a maximum of two years. And it also saw the decommissioning of weapons. So those, I presume, are elements of what you're talking about in terms of that there was a kind of amnesty. Well, there was a kind of amnesty. It's always difficult to palate. Uh, but as I said before, the climate, in my view, was right. Not least, a lot of the evidence had been destroyed. So, I mean, if you're bringing weapons and destroying them, then clearly that forensic evidence is, is, is not destroyed as well. Um, so, yes, at the, at the time, I did think this might be a moment to bring this about, but of course, it never came into being. And the comfort letter, you also mentioned that when you were at Stormont. Can you give us your views on that? Well, I think it's subsequently become problematic mm -hmm. because from a prosecutorial perspective, if the state makes representation that you won't be prosecuted, then I was a former prosecutor and I would make representations to the other side, if you like, the defence team, and, and the defendant was entitled, in my view, to rely on those representations. I don't think that was skillfully handled, to be honest. Okay, so let's move on then to, to the reasons why you changed your mind. And I think you'll need to talk to us probably about um, Brexit, but also about the Overseas Operations Bill. So you, can, you, can you take us through that, those two things, and why they, they changed your mind in relation to this? I think if, if I... Wind back the clock, um, I found myself, as I said before, involved in 2003, long after I left Northern Ireland. I found myself as a footnote in the torture narrative because I came across the mistreatment of prisoners in Iraq. And that wasn't just as presented a one-off bad apple situation. This was systematic. It was implemented by the state and perpetrated over a long period of time. Now it's been presented as you know, one-off bad apples uh, in, on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's been presented as, you know, as lawyers, you know, human rights lawyers, greedy for legal aid, uh, deliberately trying to line their own pockets. It, the whole description has been a travesty. The vast majority of cases involved interrogation authorized by the state where the five techniques and another technique called harshing was employed by interrogators. In other words, it is not a legal, it is not a fiction, it is not dreamt up by lawyers simply trying to line their pockets or alleged victims trying to, to gain compensation. It happened and no one has been held accountable for it. But the way it's presented to the British public is that these claims are vexatious Indeed, I trace back the word vexatious to the Conservative Party manifesto. Uh, and that line is parroted by the media the whole time. The only problem is there are no vexatious claims. So when it kept this claim came under closer scrutiny, 
in the House of Commons. Uh, and Johnny Mercer, no relation by the way, uh, was being questioned. He was asked to name a vexatious case. There are none. But the whole premise on which the Overseas Operations Bill was, was presented to the wider public was, this, was, this, was that this bill was to prevent so-called vexatious claims. In other words, it was brought in bad faith. It's a false narrative. It simply isn't true. And I know because I'm close to the events. So the whole premise on which the legislation was brought was false to start with. Secondly, the Overseas Operations Bill in a sense proposed costly because the, the, the main thrust of the bill was that there was a presumption against prosecution after five years had elapsed. In other words, get to the five year point. And it was almost certain that, that those alleged offences wouldn't see the light of day in a courtroom. Now I'd spent my life to that point, uh, specialising the law of armed conflict and trying to uphold the laws of war on the battlefield. And now the state which I served was seeking to give an amnesty for those so-called offences. What was worse it was, was their fingerprints were all over many of those offences. To me, this, the British government was drafting its own defence. It was perfect. And furthermore, if you go down that line, you undermine the whole bedrock of battlefield discipline which is so essential. So there was no way that I was going to stand at the, on the wings during the Overseas Operations Bill without making my views known. I'm, I'm one of the few lawyers to have given legal advice on the battlefield, real time. And this was going to undermine the whole edifice. It was a travesty. Well, you said at the time that it would decriminalise torture. In effect, it does. Lord Guthrie, interestingly, a former field marshal in the British Army, used the word the de facto decriminalisation of torture. So he got it very clearly. We had some very senior voices who also spoke out against the overseas operation. <clears throat> but if you have a five year amnesty, I mean, many conflicts go on for five years. So people who've been tortured may not have a chance to make their suffering known until that point. There was one very telling moment in the debate where a victim of sexual abuse in conflict said that it took him 30 years to be able to speak about the suffering he had endured in that, that situation of conflict. So to have a five-year amnesty was a nonsense. There were also legal impediments, which I'll come on to, that made it very difficult as well. Uh, well, maybe you'd like to just tell us a little bit about those legal Im impediments. Yeah. Well, the first thing is that the, as far as torture is concerned, uh, the law against torture is largely in the UN Convention Against Torture. So that sets out the duties and obligations upon a state with regard to torture and torture victims. And it, the British government's a signatory to that convention. But nowhere in the UN Convention on Torture is the uh, permission to have an amnesty against torturers. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The state has signed up to a treaty which says that we will hold torturers to account and there is universal jurisdiction. Furthermore, the committee on the UN Committee on Torture has expressly stated that you cannot have a statute of limitations. And therefore what the British government was proposing to do was undermine an international treaty to which it was a signatory. And in my view, that couldn't be permitted either. Not only was it morally offensive to say that torturers might potentially get away with torturing someone, but also to undermine international law is not just a sport of an idle hour for a government. If you take it seriously, you signed it, you stick to it. The second thing was, with regard to grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions, um, again, the Geneva Conventions have no provision for an amnesty. And so if you gave a five-year limitation period for bringing prosecutions, to me it seemed to be an invitation to run down the clock, get to your five-year point, and then you're off the hook again because the presumption against prosecution kicks in. So in my view, it undermined not only the Geneva Conventions, 
but also potentially the Rome Statute, uh, which is there to bring grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions and, and crimes against humanity uh, to book. Um, so again, I, I spent my entire life teaching this, not only to the British Army, but armies across the world. And now my own government was trying to undermine it. Interestingly, one of the comments I made was that if we go down this road, there are going to be plenty of rogue states who are going to be sort of looking on with great interest as to what we're doing in the United Kingdom. And by chance, the Sri Lankan government said how interested they were in the legislation we were proposing. I'm not, I bet they were. Yes. It would just be perfect to have their own overseas operations. We were making a fool of ourselves. You know, everything we say about global Britain and about you know, being a rules-based international order was being undermined by this bill. I would just say that we did in effect win in the end because those ex offences were excluded. So it was, as one person said, democracy in action and all our lobbying and campaigning, the government backed down, but boy, was it hard work. Well, of course, one of the reasons it was such hard work was the fact that, uh, you know, the former minister for veterans who, as you comment, you've pointed out, is no relation, Johnny Mercer, he promoted a whole way of looking at it, which was it was about protecting our boys, our gallant boys, against uh, vexatious prosecutions. Did you meet with a lot of hostility or opprobrium because you appeared, therefore, to be going against that notion of our gallant boys or, or not? I've, no, I've, I've never met any opposition latterly. I mean, I, I'm, you don't know quite where I live, but I'm pretty remote. I'm in the middle of the Yorkshire Dale with some fairly poor internet connections. So, no, I didn't. And, and peculiarly, I found people coming out to support me in what I was saying. So it's, I've always taken this particular approach and actually it's interesting in time, people will actually say, look, I, I fully agree with you. And, and some very interesting allies, not least a man called David Bernest, who's now dead, tragically died in the middle of this, but we fired the opening shots in this battle against the overseas operations bill. And he was a former commanding officer of two para and very much believed in, in the line that I was taking and the necessity for battlefield discipline. So that was a very interesting ally. And we, we fired up a joint letter off to the Times very early on in the campaign. So it, it was very interesting to see where your friends come from. Okay, well, you've mentioned battlefield discipline and the, the paratroop regiment. So let's move to Bloody Sunday now. Um, <clears throat> You mentioned to me before that you were very influenced by reading an article by an unusual person to have inspired you in this direction, uh, Douglas Murray in The Spectator. Can you tell us about that article and, and um, why you found it something that you could relate so strongly to? Well, Bloody Sunday obviously goes back long before I was you know, in the army, it's, it's in, in the distant past. Very interestingly, actually, because I was interested in, in, in the law and how the law interacted with military operations, I'd actually found a copy of the Widgery Report in the book in the uh, bookshop at Heathrow Airport and had bought a copy and read it uh, a long time before the Savile Inquiry and so on and so forth. So I, to, be, to be fair, I hadn't followed the Savile Inquiry with the, with the depth and, and detail, perhaps, that is needed, but that's a very difficult task in any event. You'd have to take a huge amount of time to do that. Um, but this was an occasion where um, I, I knew what had been alleged that the British soldiers had come under fire, and that presents one scenario. Um, but when I read Douglas Murray in The Spectator, uh, I was, it was really a resting piece because he's followed the Savile Inquiry in great detail. And he is very damning about some of the evidence given by British soldiers. Yeah, he mentions at the very beginning of the article that he realised within a few hours of sitting at the Savile Inquiry that he was looking at unapologetic killers and unrelenting liars. That's right. I mean, those are very strong words. This is a right wing magazine at the same time. I mean, to be fair to Douglas Murray, he does give it to you absolutely straight. And when I heard about the gratuitous killings 
of people like Patrick Doherty, Doherty and Barry McGuigan, was it Barney McGuigan, sorry, of Barney McGuigan, you know, anyone who served in the armed forces, knowing that a soldier had gratuitously, in this case, killed someone, I'm sorry, no army officer, NCO, army officer, or anyone can stand by and say, these men should be excused. It just wouldn't happen. And, and I, I, if Johnny Mercer was prepared to look at this straight in the eye and say, look, this was one of your, let's imagine it was one of your soldiers committing gratuitous acts of violence whilst on active duty. There's no way you could stand by and say they should be immune from prosecution. I'm sorry. And I've, I've discussed it with a wider military community because we meet, obviously, we're friends and we go back a long way. We, we, we've talked about this over dinner and things. And we all agree, no commander, because command is about responsibility and being held to account. No one could stand by and say, these people shouldn't be brought to book. What do you think about what has happened in relation to... Um, the various soldier, soldiers who were going to be prosecuted, particularly in relation to Bloody Sunday, the soldier known as Soldier F? Well, if, if what Douglas Murray says is correct, then I don't think any army officer could stand in the wings and say this shouldn't happen. I'm really sorry. I think as Douglas Murray says, soldiers should be held to a higher standard. Uh, you know, no, what, no society can sit, to, you know, sit on the wings and say gratuitous violence can be excused. Yes, the heat of battle is one thing, gratuitous violence is another. And if I can look, make a comparison with Iraq, it was very, it's very difficult in a battlefield situation. You know, we would take prisoners. It's not the Boy Scouts. But once a man was reduced to capture, you jolly well behave yourself. And that's why we have strict discipline in the armed forces. So we, people will go into difficult situations but also conduct themselves properly in those situations. And if what Douglas Murray describes is correct, and I've no reason to doubt it, then I'm sorry, but no one could sit there and say there must be an amnesty. Well, just um, given that nobody now appears to be going to be tried in relation to Bloody Sunday, what do you think should be the next thing to happen? I mean, obviously the families are, are very disappointed to say the least uh, by this outcome. That's, that's a really difficult question. I think a lot of the prosecutions have been uh, substantially disadvantaged by the fact that statements were taken at the time which weren't under caution, and therefore that evidence is subsequently inadmissible in a subsequent trial, and, and that's to be regretted. Uh, where this, I think, I, I mean, David Cameron gave an apology for Bloody Sunday. And if it's incumbent, as far as I'm concerned, upon the state where wrongdoing has been perpetrated by someone acting on the orders of this of the state to make recompense, either through apology and or compensation. If the prosecution is not viable, then that's the next step down. I don't I don't know where else you can go on. Well, one of the things that some people have always felt about um, even the Savile inquiry was that, you know, one thing that has not been pursued really is, is uh, to what level did this go? Because, I mean, you talk about battlefield discipline, but many people have commented on the fact that the parachute regiment was really very different uh, from other regiments which had served in Northern Ireland, that it it appeared an extremely unusual force to send in to police a civil rights march. The parach parachute regiment are high readiness troops. Um, I was rector of the Falkland Islands for a while and actually the, the, the most effective troops there were, the, were the, the commandos and the paratroopers because they are battle ready most of the time. Uh, and so in a situation like that, I can see that regiments like that, such as the paratroopers, may be more antagonistic towards their perceived adversaries. Uh, and that's, that's, that is not easy. Uh, but that's separate from the issue of state, of state complicity. Um, there's always, as I know from Iraq, there's always the potential for state complicity in such matters. But unless you're in the middle of the narrative, 
it's very hard to make a make any particular claims. Obviously, nigh on impossible because you just don't know. Um, but one of the, the perversities of an amnesty is that the state also potentially benefits because its own complicity, if there is any, will never be seen. So rather like the Overseas Operations Bill, the state can potentially legislate to cover its own tracks. Um, uh, Lord Savile commented uh, in his conclusions to his report that this had been a disaster for, I think he said the disaster for the families involved and a catastrophe for Ireland uh, or catastrophe for um, Northern Ireland. I'm, I'm not certain exactly of the quote at this point, but what has, has it been catastrophic for Britain's reputation that things like the hooded men uh, shoot to kill uh, Bloody Sunday? What damage have those done to, to Britain's reputation? It's, very, it's a very hard question to answer. I, I think... As a lawyer? Um, well, I think I think we have moved. I think legally we have moved considerable distance from the 1970s to the present day. As I said, I saw the Lee Clegg case as a watershed uh, in our approach to potential litigation. Uh, in for the first time, we were, we were being held accountable for each shot fired. And there was a lot of resistance to that. You know, the usual sort of stuff with soldiers are soldiers and, and it's unfair and all the rest of it. And there is some, you know, it is difficult for soldiers on operation to be under no doubt about that. Put yourself in that position. It's extremely difficult. But I think if we hadn't got the message with the plague case, hopefully we're getting the message now that the age of scrutiny and accountability is upon us. I think it might be a little bit difficult to conclude that, though, given the fact that it's just last year or the year before that um, the British Secretary of State, Brandon Lewis, proposed an amnesty, which has in fact given its title to this event, um, because a number of human rights lawyers here and specialists uh, said that the amnesty proposed by Brandon Lewis was worse than anything that Pinochet ever uh, devised. Would you share that view of it? Well, I can't make the comparison with Pinochet, um, but when I say the age of accountability is over, that also applies to the proposed amnesty, because I think that day and age has gone, and that whereas once there was an opportunity for amnesty, I think that has since gone, uh, and accountability is now upon us. I should just say that's my legal aspiration, that the British Army conducts itself not only in accordance with international and domestic law, but the highest standards. We are a profession of arms. Um, my worry is that actually post Iraq, post Afghanistan, uh, the age of cover up is still with us. I think it's almost been masterful. I thought that the Rome Statute of 1998 was the, was the sort of the great arbiter that somehow it would bring Western democratic governments to book and that our all, everything would be done to a much higher standard. I fear that statecraft, statecraft has been developed to a much higher standard, but accountability is still sadly lacking. And just in, in terms of Brexit, um, <laughs> one of the things about Brexit appeared to be that the uh, British government wished to wriggle out of, of various human rights, international human rights um, obligations? Um, well, we, it remains to be seen, of course, our human rights obligations are the result of being a member of the Council of Europe, of which we're still a member. Um, but the great strength of the Human Rights Act, which should not be overlooked, is the accountability of the state. It holds them to book. It's not the soldier who's brought in. To, to, to say whatever he's got to say. It's the minister, it's the government, it's the state, and that's really important. So we, under, like the undermining battlefield, the Geneva Conventions, you undermine human rights at your peril at the same time. Um, I think that a lot of people in, in Ireland at the moment are concerned that there's 
something like indifference towards the Northern Irish question in the United Kingdom, in, in Great Britain. What would be your view of that as, as someone who's no longer involved in the British Army, but is obviously very politically engaged in, in your thinking? I find, to be honest, I find it all the time, uh, particularly with the Brexit vote. I, mean, I, I, I live in a very conservative part of the United Kingdom. I don't think anyone considered that I've spoke to considered Northern Ireland when they were voting for Brexit. And I say to people, well, what about Northern Ireland? I, I'm really cross that they're so indifferent to the peace process that was achieved, as if it can somehow be tossed to one side, or they didn't even bother to engage themselves in thinking about it properly when they came to cast their vote. It was all about ridiculous notions of sovereignty you know, jam and Jerusalem. I mean, it's absolute nonsense. Uh, one, Bre one person who voted for Brexit, who I tackled, I said, well, what about Northern Ireland? And they said, why are you always asking questions? <laughs> I'm really sorry, but what was achieved in Northern Ireland was astonishing. And to, it's, as I think as Jonathan Powell said, to make it a casual political casualty is just dreadful. I think you told me that you had met Lord Frost, is that correct? I did give him a piece of my mind. He resigned. What did you tell him? I don't think there's any relationship between me speaking to him and the, on a pavement outside in Westminster. <laughs> his subsequent resignation. But if there was, good. <laughs> okay, is there anything else that, that you would like to, to add, Reverend Mercer, before yeah, we, we conclude just, our conversation? I just think... But the other thing that has to be mentioned is the fundamental equality of all human beings uh, from whatever political background, from whatever creed, colour or whatever, that if it was your relation who'd been killed, whether you're loyalist, nationalist, British Army or whatever, each and every person has an equal right to justice and fairness and transparency. And if we don't do that, then that too could happen adverse consequences. So from a theological perspective, that fundamental equality before the law uh, is really important too. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Reverend Mercer, for uh, taking part in the conversation today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much for asking me. Thank you.